My story's moving at last into the 20th century. Not the late 20th century, the world we recognize today, but the early 20th century, the Edwardian age as it's known. An era of petticoats and boaters and handlebar mustaches. And it's time to reflect on how far we'd come, how far we'd progressed as a people over the centuries to this dawning of the modern era. And my journey's brought me, this may surprise you, to Blackpool. Truth be told, Blackpool's feeling a little tatty these days. It's struggled over the last 20 years to compete with cheap holidays in the Med. But back in the days before the First World War, this was where quite literally millions of working people from all across Northern England came to have their holidays. This is the place they came to have fun. And the very fact that this place existed, the fact that fun was available to all, affordable to all, it shows us how much we'd progressed as a nation. It shows us how much our lives had changed. The craze for sea bathing began in the late 18th century in places like Margate and Brighton, close to the wealth and high fashion of London. Sea air and a bracing dip was seen in those days as a health cure, but only for the well-to-do. This wasn't for everyone. You contrast that situation with the scene here in Blackpool in the summer season of 1904. Three million mostly working-class holidaymakers riding on donkeys, paddling in the sea. Clearly, over a century, something fundamental had happened to British society, an explosion of opportunity, a democratization, nothing less, of pleasure. Why did it happen? Well, in part, it had to do with transport, the invention of steam engines in the early 19th century, the laying down of mile upon mile of iron track in the reign of Queen Victoria. The creation of a railway network opened up new horizons for a whole class of Brits who had never known the joys of travel. You could get a third-class return ticket from, say, Leeds to Blackpool for the cost of a loaf of bread. But it wasn't just steam trains that explained the boom in holidays. Blackpool had a railway line from the 1840s onwards. It wasn't until the 1870s, 1880s, that Blackpool, the resort, really took off. No. The thing that explains Blackpool's success was that, quite simply, we were all getting more prosperous. More money in our pockets brought us the freedom to do as we chose. Things in the late 19th century were simply getting better. Security of employment, decent hours, decent wages led to increased confidence. Working families weren't scrimping now, day after day, for their very survival. They were doing okay. They could put money aside for a rainy day. They could budget for the extras that made life fun. Wake's Week was the result of this new prosperity. For one week a year, each of the northern factory towns, in turn, simply shut down. The looms fell silent. The factories closed. The bosses used this week to service the machines and lime wash the walls. Everyone else had fun. Special chartered trains took them west to Blackpool. Special chartered trains took them home again. And if, at the end of the week, you had money left in your pocket, it was a wake's week point of honor to chuck it out the window on the way back home. Blackpool, even now, oozes memories of those glory days. This is North Pier, which was very refined for promenading up and down. Over there, you've got Central Pier, which offered dancing and cheap trips on a paddle steamer. In town, for a sixpence, you might visit the Winter Gardens, where you might see a lady acrobat hurling through the air as a human cannonball. And here we have the symbol of Blackpool, most famous of all, Blackpool Tower, built in the 1890s, home to a circus, a zoo, an aquarium, and the most sumptuous public space in Edwardian England, the Tower Ballroom, where even now the organ plays as the couples polish the parquet. Had things really got better? It's always hard to quantify the idea of progress. 
Some historians like to knock the Edwardian age as a time of delusion, when our hope of things getting better just masked the same old problems, problems of class, problems of poverty. It's true, we were back then still hopelessly divided by class, by wealth. It's true in the inner cities, in London, in Glasgow, in Manchester, the problem of poverty remained. But we were at least now facing the problems. In 1909, a liberal government pushed through a wave of reforms, laying the building blocks of what's now called the welfare state. The elderly, the sick, the unemployed, all now would have a safety net. None should fall by the wayside. And who should pay for this safety net? Well, here was the truly radical idea. Not just the rich, but all of us. Every taxpayer, every member of this new, inclusive society. And no, it wasn't a burden. It was a privilege. A privilege we fought for. We took to the streets. We campaigned for the right to be involved. The right to be treated as active members of an inclusive society. We won that right and we burst forth into the modern world. I don't think our society's ever been happier, ever been healthier than in the early years of the 20th century. Because truth be told, this wasn't about reality, this was about potential. Not who we were, but what we might yet become in this new democratic age. Have we lived up to their dream? Well, that's the story I've yet to tell. <laughs>